Okay, so now what we're going to do is we are going to look at the kidney in a little bit more detail. So um, the different parts of the kidney uh, will be used for filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion, just like you know we had talked about in the previous video. So um, let's take a look at the kidney, and I might pop back to this page if we need to. But um, this is the functional unit of the kidney. This is called the nephron. So when you were looking at the kidney here, um, this is the cortex and the medulla, right? And the collecting duct. The nephrons, there's a whole bunch of them and they exist. They're going in and out between the cortex and the medulla. So you'll see there'll be areas that are in the cortex and then they're gonna drop down into the medulla and back up to the cortex. So you should see that. Um, on the diagram when we get there. Okay, so here's this. This is the kidney, right? Here's the cortex part, and here's the medulla. And so you can see the nephron, well, part of it is going through in the cortex, and then it's gonna drop down into the medulla and then back up again into the um, cortex again, and then, and then back down. Eventually that collecting duct is gonna end up um, going out into the duct so it can be sent down to, as urine to the ureter that'll then go to the bladder. So we're gonna look at a few different parts of this nephron. First, we're gonna start here. This is called uh, the glomerulus, all these little uh, capillaries, and this thing surrounding it is called the Bowman's capsule. You're, you're gonna need to go back, and I'll show you another picture, but you'll have to go back and label uh, the nephron. Then here is the proximal convoluted tubule. The convoluted has to do with the, you know, the squigglies. Um, and then, it drops down into something called the loop of Henle, which is gonna be used for water and salt balance. And then we're gonna get this distal tubule, um, distal convoluted tubule, and then finally the collecting duct. So here, the Bowman's capsule and the, um, and the glomerulus, that part is for filtration, okay? And then the reabsorption of important materials is gonna be here in the, uh, proximal convoluted tubule. There's gonna be a long series of kind of water balance and uptake and salt, you know, balance back and forth. And both here and here, there's actually gonna be some secretion of additional toxins and other things that need to be carried out. And then finally, um, the urine will get collected uh, in the collecting duct. And that is where the final water balance will be um, based on if your body needs water or not. There's a lot of different hormone, or there's one different hormone that we're gonna talk about um, called the antidiuretic hormone that's gonna affect that collecting duct. Okay, so first let's start here when we're doing filtration. That happens in the glomerulus with the Bowman's capsule surrounding it. So the blood is gonna enter in the afferent arterial and leave in the efferent arterial. Now you notice the diameter here. This is a wider diameter than the efferent arterial and that is gonna cause high pressure, like you're putting a finger over a hose here. So the blood going through is gonna be at really high pressure, which is gonna push that blood out of the capillaries where it will be collected, not all of the blood, but water and other things, um, and salts and nutrients are gonna be um, forced into this Bowman's capsule. So this is the high pressure area. All right, so this blood, it's under high pressure, um, and it forces small molecules into the Bowman's capsule. And you can see there's these little foot, like they're called podocytes, and those are kind of surrounding it to maximize surface area. Um, and then another important aspect is that the cap capillaries here are fenestrated. What that means is they have tiny little slits and that's gonna let um, certain molecules out. So this is definitely like a selective membrane here, but it, these little slits are gonna let more water and other things just kind of out of it. So you need to know the word fenestrated, they might use it. Um, the inner membrane of this Bowman's cap capsule is where it's going to collect, you know, the major components um, pass through. Uh, but the things that can't actually get through are um, proteins, like larger molecules, proteins, cells. So any of you, your important cells, your red blood cells and platelets and other things like that that are too big, they aren't gonna go through the slits. Uh, larger proteins can't fit through the slits. But anything that's pretty small, it could be glucose, it could be salts, it could be ions and water, that's all gonna get pushed into the Bowman's capsule. All right. Um, 
And so the small substances, here's that list that can be pushed out, urea ions, sodium chloride, hydrogen ions, bicarbonate ions, glucose, amino acids, drugs and poisons, and all of that gets pushed into here and that is called the filtrate, okay? Um, the blood left over in the capillary is gonna leave here through the efferent arterial. The difference between the blood before and after, we're gonna look at one more slide there, but essentially um, the things that are left in the blood um, are proteins and cells and you know uh, some larger molecules where everything else gets shoved into the filtrate. Obviously, there's still going to be um, water and you know blood plasma being able to to move through, but still there's going to be a whole lot of it that gets pushed into the Bowman's capsule, and it's now called the filtrate. What is collecting in here? Here is what the the blood has before it enters the nephron, and that's the blood plasma, and then this is the filtrate. So if you're looking at the blood plasma, um, it has all of these things, right? But then what gets pushed out into the filtrate, you can see everything's close to the same. Um, however, you're gonna get not very much protein in that filtrate because it's not gonna fit through. Okay, and so before the blood en enters the nephron, it has all of these things. Um, and after, it will still have, you know, some water and, and some of everything else, but it definitely will have those proteins, unlike the, what's in the filtrate. All right. So coming out, it won't have these in the same concentration, but it will have the proteins in a similar concentration. Okay. So once it's been filtered, so here's where it comes out. Here's the Bowman's capsule. And now the filtrate is going to pass down the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, and what this is doing is this is the reabsorption stage. So if you were to look at a cross section, like we were to cut that open and look at it from the end, you can see that this is, this is highly specialized for reabsorbing. It looks a lot like the, you know, the intestine with all the villi and microvilli. So there's, again, a brush border along here to increase surface area so more can be absorbed. Um, and there's going to be a lot of mitochondria because some of those things have to be actively transported um, out of the filtrate into, back into the, you know, there'll be more capillaries and other things to be able to absorb these things. So you can see um, things like glucose, water, salts, and amino acids, which are helpful to our body, those will get reabsorbed. And we will have um, some active transport into, um, into that pro proximal uh, convoluted tubule that is just essentially things that we don't want. Like um, if some of the toxins and other things didn't make it in through the filtrate, they can be um, secreted into the filtrate here. All right, so then, oh, and these arrows, if you're curious, shows which things are generally actively transported out and definitely salts and things like glucose and those types of nutrients are gonna be actively transported out. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the loop of Henle. So here's the loop of Henle. And the purpose of the loop of Henle is to maintain hypertonic conditions in the medulla. Um, and it's, it's also, I guess I would say that's one thing that it does, but the purpose of it doing that is to maintain water balance and salt balance within the filtrate and, and your body when, when necessary. So when the filtrate comes down here, um, what's going on is that the, the difference in the salt concentration between the cortex and the inner medulla is pretty huge. It's not, doesn't have a lot of salt here, not a lot of NACL, but it's gonna have a lot. So it's getting more and more concentrated as you go deeper into the medulla. And this, this is called the descending limb, and then there's a hairpin turn and the ascending limb. The descending limb, um, and let me show you, is filtrate passes down this descending limb. The water is lost through osmosis because this, because the medulla is gonna be really hypertonic to the water. So you can see, um, the medulla at this place is 600 and the water between here and here, the 300 to 600 is going to keep losing through osmosis until it's the same concentration as the medulla. So you can see all along the way water gets lost. And that happens because there are a whole bunch of aquaporins. Those are the little 
um, protein channels that allow water to freely pass through. So we're encouraging osmosis here. There's actually very little, very few salt channels. So salt can't really leave quite so easily. And that's why we're maintaining the salt balance because salt is staying in, but water is leaving. When after it goes around the turn and starts going up the ascending limb, this now is impermeable to water. So you see there's no water coming out, um, but NACL gets actively transported um, out into the medulla all along the way here. So you can see NACL has to, and it has to be actively transported out because it's gonna be usually less concentrated uh, within the filtrate. And pumping all that NACL out allows for that concentration gradient. So it gets more and more concentrated in NACL as you move towards the, um, towards the medulla. All right, then it's gonna enter the distal convoluted tubule. And this is essentially to help maintain the pH of the blood um, and it'll put some buffers in if necessary. So normal blood proteins can't maintain the pH of 7.4. The distal tubule will adjust the amount of hydrogen ions that it'll take out or put into the blood uh, or into the filtrate and uh, put into the blood and sort of allow that last little bit. And I think I also read that there can be um, a continuing to load of toxins and other things. And then after it gets here into the collecting duct, this is where we're gonna really regulate water using the antidiuretic hormone ADH. So the next slide is gonna be taking us onto that. So here is an interesting pathway. This is the collecting duct, okay? And ADH is going to act on the collecting duct, making it permeable or not. So you can see if there's ADH it's going to increase the permeability of the collecting duct. Increasing the permeability allows more water to leave the collecting duct. So that allows your body to take in more water. So if you're feeling dehydrated, the ADH will allow your body to pull out as much, of, much water as possible from the collecting duct. And that's gonna make your urine really yellow and intense and not so hydrated. But if you're feeling hydrated and there's no ADH, the collecting duct's relatively impermeable and you'll lose plenty of water through your urine, which will make it clear. So here's kind of, if water content of the blood is low, ADH is secreted from the posterior pituitary gland. Okay, so here's our posterior pituitary. The presence of ADH causes the walls of these collecting ducts to become fully permeable. All the water leaves, right? Um, and then, oh, when all the water leaves, you become rehydrated again. and then, you know, it's a negative feedback loop. Um, and then if the water content's high, no ADH is secreted. So that'll shut this off and allow your normal uh, blood osmolarity to come out in the urine. So this is kind of interesting. There's two pathways shown here. If, if your osmoreceptors say, ah, I'm thirsty, you're going to make ADH and you're going to feel thirsty and start drinking water. And both of these things will create a higher uh, water content in your blood. And if you have a high enough water content in your blood, then you're good to go. And then you don't need to, then it'll shut this down and it, more ADH and your thirst will subside. Um, okay. Last couple things. You do need to be able to draw and label a diagram of the nephron. Uh, so just, you know, all these little parts and you can see this is a little bit more what it looks like in a real life type drawing. Um, so Take the time to look in your book to label all the different parts of it and using uh, your notes and uh, make sure that you're able to kind of talk about what's been happening along the way. And then the last, there's three more questions to consider that I'm actually not going to include in this video right now because I think you'll be able to handle it with the reading on pages 496 and 498. And um, you can kind of look at some of the bios on worksheets. All right. Well, hopefully this was helpful to get you through the kidney.